So the ventilator is alarming. What do I do? Well, I'm going to go over the different types of ventilator alarms and let you know which ones are really important to pay attention to and which can be responded to not as acutely. We're also going to describe the interventions to respond to a variety of ventilator alarms. The most important thing to do with a patient on a ventilator when you hear an alarm is to assess the patient first because you're going to have an auditory alarm. You're going to hear it. Your immediate your immediate response is going to want to turn and look at the ventilator and assess the ventilator. But you want to assess the patient. Because I'll tell you, one of the most common things that happens with a patient on a ventilator who's getting a lot of pressure, like these patients with ARDS will be getting, is for them to disconnect by themselves. So I have ventilator tubing here and an endotracheal tube. And if you can see, this connection between the two can pop apart really easily. So you may see a patient, you may hear an alarm. The first thing you do, look at their face and make sure these two pieces are connected. And if they're not, put them back together. You also wanna look at their work of breathing. Are they gasping? Are they short of breath? What's their skin color? What's their level of consciousness? Check the oximeter. Has the, is that changed? What's their respiratory rate? Then once, if you can't see what's anything wrong with them, then scan the ventilator to determine the cause of the alarm. They'll, they also have a visual readout on the monitor. If you're unable to correctly correct a ventilator alarm and a patient is in distress, you want to call for help and initiate bag valve mask or bag valve ventilation with a filter that I mentioned earlier, the, the high, um, the very important HEPA filter. Now, in patients with COVID-19, we're trying to avoid using the bag valve device on these patients. But if you can't figure out what's wrong and the patient is in distress, they need to have their ventilations assisted. So the most common ventilator alarm is a high pressure alarm. You wanna, again, assess that patient first and then scan the ventilator. One thing that you wanna definitely look at is their peak airway pressure, also known as their peak inspiratory pressure. So ask your respiratory therapist or your ICU nurse to show you where to assess that. Normally, the goal is less than 35 centimeters of water. But in these patients who are on um, ventilators with ARDS who have COVID-19, it's taking higher pressures to ventilate them. So that might be set at a, an alarm high of 50. And if they're hitting that, it could be triggering a high pressure alarm. So please ask your ICU nurses or your RTs to help you know where to assess that. Some of the other causes for high pressure are something as simple as coughing or gagging. That can trigger a high pressure alarm and it'll alarm and then it'll reset itself. If a patient is biting the ET tube, they may be agitated. They might have pain. They may need to have some analgesia. And if analgesia doesn't work, then they may need to have some sedatives. If they're attempting to talk, it can trigger a high pressure alarm. So I wanna make sure that this is something you also tell your patients is that that endotracheal tube tip is below the vocal cords. The cuff is below the vocal cords. So the patient can't talk. They'll be able to talk once the tube comes out. And that's important to reassure your patients that they know that because they don't understand what's going on. They just know that they can't talk. Secretions in the endotracheal tube may also cause a high pressure alarm. So the patient might require suctioning and I'll talk about that in a minute. It might be pulmonary edema. It could be bronchospasm, could be a pneumothorax or it could be ARDS. And I'll go over each of those individually. So what do I do if they're coughing or gagging? Well, does the patient need oral suctioning? That's one of the simplest fix, fixes for coughing or gagging. If they're biting the tube, you wanna reassure that patient. And if that doesn't work, then you wanna tr try analgesia. And if analgesia doesn't work, then you wanna try sedation, depending on your assessment. If it's pulmonary edema, you'll consult your provider. If it's bronchospasm, you wanna consult your RT or the provider. The patient may have a PRN order for a bronchodilator. You may also need to assist with the administration of a nebulizer in a closed circuit on the ventilator or a metered dose inhaler, although we are reading and hearing that metered dose inhalers are in short supply because of the COVID-19 crisis. If it's a pneumothorax that you suspect, you're going to consult your provider and prepare for chest tube insertion. And if you're going to have to help with chest tube insertion, you're going to want to make sure you know where your chest tube supplies are on your unit. So be sure to find those as part of your orientation to your units. 
And then if it's secretions, you're going to suction the catheter as needed. Endotracheal tubes do not get routinely suctioned. So with ARDS, what's happening? Well, in a normal lung, these patients have dry, spongy lungs. They're, they have, they're very elastic. They have low resistance to breathing, so they inhale and exhale very easily. In ARDS, it's a non-cardiogenic edema, and the ARDS lungs are soggy sponges. They become very stiff, like trying to, the patient's like it's trying to breathe through cardboard. The technical terms for this is decreased compliance. I think of decreased compliance and I equate that to stiff lungs. And, and there's a high resistance to breathe. It's very difficult to move air in and out. And we'll talk about the interventions for ARDS later, but basically it's low tidal volumes and a high PEEP and prone positioning and different ventilator modes. But again, I'll talk more about that in the section on ventilator modes. So what do I do to suction a patient on a ventilator? Well, the equipment that you're gonna need is what I'm showing you on the screen, and then I'm gonna demonstrate this for you too. But on the first slide on the left, you're gonna have the inline suction, which you can see toward the bottom of that picture. The ventilator tubing going to the machine is at the top of the picture, and then the endotracheal tube is to the left where the subglottic suction, which is that yellow part is. In the middle then, it's gonna show you how to hold it. So basically, and I'm gonna take my tube and show you this right here as well. So here's the endotracheal tube connected to the ventilator here, and my inline suction is right here, and this machine, this is going to the machine. So if you take your thumb and your index finger and you put it around the endotracheal tube below where it's connected to the machine, you take your next three fingers and grab the intersection of the endotracheal tube to the machine. So your thumb and index finger here, the next three fingers wrap there, and then put your little finger in the Y right there. You see that where it's going like that and see it on the picture? Then you've got a good grasp of that tube, very simply like that, and you can hold on to it and stabilize it to suction. So it makes it a lot easier for, that, for you to hold on to it and then you won't accidentally extubate the patient when you're suctioning them. So what do I do to suction? Well, I'm gonna pre-oxygenate my patient on the ventilator with 100% oxygen. And on the ventilator, there is a tube for you to, to or not a tube, there's a button for you to press that will deliver approximately two minutes of 100% oxygen. So ask your respiratory therapist or your nurse where your ICU nurse, where that button is so you'll know how to activate it. You wanna hold the endotracheal tube and tubing securely as I showed you. And after at least 30 seconds of that 100% O2, then you can suction them. Well, the suction catheter is here and the procedure includes pushing that catheter inside the sheath down into the endotracheal tube like that. As soon as you meet resistance, you pull back one to two centimeters, and then you're going to depress the suction and you're going to pull in a motion, continuously suctioning till it comes back into the sheath. Then you're going to reassess your patient. Now it's very important that you do this in less than 10 seconds because you don't want to pull all the patient's oxygen out. You also want to do it in a slow, continuous pull in less than 10 seconds, always already by stabilizing the tube like I showed you. So once you're done with that suction, you reassess the patient. You ensure that there is at least 30 seconds of 100% oxygen after you suctioned prior to suctioning again if needed. Um, it's very important to do that so because these patients already have so much problem with hypoxia, we don't wanna make it worse just by suctioning them. AACN is providing a suction procedure resource for you. It's from our um, procedure manual for high acuity, progressive, and critical care, COVID-19 resources e-learning program, which I will talk to you more about and give you the link to at the end of this webinar. Another alarm that's really scary and very important to an, an attend to is the apnea alarm. Apnea alarms um, can be caused if the ventilator disconnects from the patient. If the patient stops breathing, um, what are the causes of that? Well, it could have been over sedation. It could have been neuromuscular paralysis and the ventilator settings aren't adjusted to accommodate for the paralysis that has occurred. Another ventilator can cause 
apnea alarms is that it could have failed. But we'll talk a little bit about what to do if a machine fails. So what do you do for apnea? Well, again, assess that patient first. Is the ventilator connected to the endotracheal tube? Are they breathing? If not, you're going to call for help. And if you have to, initiate the bag valve resuscitation with the, the filter. Is the ventilator delivering an adequate rate and volume? They may not be, and I'll talk more about that when we talk about ventilator settings. If they're over-sedated, you're going to want to decrease their sedative infusions. Use your sedation score to assess where they're at. If they have uh, neuromuscular paralysis, be sure that the respiratory therapist knows that so that you guys can collaborate and make sure the patient has adequate settings to um, overcome the neuromuscular paralysis. And then a ventilator is a machine. It's rare, but it can fail. And if it fails, then you call for help, you initiate bag valve resuscitation, again with the filter, and replace the ventilator. Hopefully that won't happen in my career in ICU, 35 years, rarely, once I think it happened, but I want to just make you sure that you know it could happen. Because when it happened to me, I was like, oh my gosh, what do I do? Well, we bagged the patient, we got a new ventilator. So that, that's, it's as simple as that. The next alarms I want to talk about are similar to apnea, but they're low pressure or low minute ventilation, meaning the patient isn't breathing fast enough or deep enough, or the pressure for some reason is just too low. A lot of the causes are the same. Is the ventilator disconnected? Are they not assisting the ventilator? Do they have too low of a respiratory rate or too low of a tidal volume? Are they oversedated? Maybe the muck is wearing off, but they still have ventilator settings to accommodate it. And again, check that connection. If they became disconnected or if any of the parts of this tubing comes disconnected, there's a lot of working parts on a ventilator. It can come disconnected at a variety of places. As a matter of fact, the far end of this blue tubing is what goes to the machine. And in my career, I'm sad to say this, but I walked by a ventilator one day and I knocked off the blue tubing off the machine. So it's easy to do it. I did it with my hip. So you just need to assess your patient, assess the machine, assess the tubing, make sure everything's connected the way it's supposed to be. So again, one of the other things that can cause low pressure or apnea or low minute ventilation is a self-extubation. Yes, the patient pulls the tube out themselves. Maybe the tubing got down by their hand and they got a hold of it and they just started tugging on it and out it came. But I'm also going to tell you that patients have very creative ways of self-extubating and one of them is using their tongues. They can pull that tube out if they work hard enough at it with their tongue. I've seen it happen. If it happens, call for help. Expect to do, use a bag valve mask to help get them ready for intubation and then prepare for an emergent reintubation with them.